The politically polarizing issue of abortion positions itself center stage, and it could turn out to be the soundbite that really takes a chunk out of the Teflon Don. Donald Trump's misstep comes as Cruz shakes off a sex scandal to become frontrunner in Wisconsin. <clears throat> President Obama positions Cuba to open up economically. Let's say hello again to our guests, Alan Sanders, Jackie Guzda, Dr. Uh, Louis Navarre, and Dr. Bart Rossi. Bart, I'll start with you. Donald Trump tends to be unscripted. Isn't that what we want in a candidate, or should he just give the scripted soundbite when it comes to the abortion issue, like every other candidate would? Well, I like what you're saying about being unscripted. I think people who present themselves as they are, and they, they're comfortable in their own skin, that's really great. Uh, but to have a winning personality, you also need to be consistent. You don't really want to discard groups and ethnic groups uh, in general. And you also ought to present yourself as if you're going to be a good listener, a la Reagan or Bill Clinton. But Trump seems to be undermining himself now. It's not just the comment about abortion and women. It's uh, the collective commentary about women and about minorities and, and about treating people inappropriately. And most people are getting sensitive about the fact that Donald Trump is not unscripted. He's not knowledgeable. He doesn't know much about health care and medical necessity or mental health. He doesn't know foreign affairs. He's abrasive to women. So he's got a problem and he's undermining himself right now. He, he might be winning the primary at the same time he's losing the general election and we're not even in that cycle yet. All right, Bart, thanks for your thoughts. Jackie, I'm going to turn to you. One of the scandals that Donald Trump has been dealing with is his campaign manager uh, accused of being um, rough with a woman, a mm -hmm. woman reporter. I can tell you as a reporter that you are body blocked, tripped, pushed, shoved, and grabbed every day, particularly when you are around a president or a top presidential candidate and you go to infringe on that candidate's space, you will get yanked away. Is this much ado about nothing? No, because she wasn't just infringing upon the space. She came in and he actually put bruises on her arm. And if you listen to the audio of that, she was like, what just happened? And you know what? Trump is thug, he's a pig, and so is his campaign manager, and it's showing. All right, let's talk about Hillary Clinton, who is often neglected in the dialogue um, on TV and across the nation. Here you have a woman who was the first lady, a United States Senator, a Secretary of State, she is perhaps one of the most qualified people to ever run for the top job in the nation. Yet, she's struggling against Bernie Sanders. What does that say about the American electorate? Do they have problems with women? No, I think they have problems with uh, the establishment. Uh, I don't think it uh, is peculiar to uh, Hillary Clinton. I think if it was a man with the same credentials, I think Bernie Sanders would do just as well against the man. I don't think it has to do with sex. It has to do with the fact that the word new is always something that's attractive to Americans, particularly young Americans. You put new on a cereal box, everybody will be interested in seeing what's new. So Bernie Sanders is a new product. He is a new product, however, that reflects an old product. If you listen to Bernie Sanders and you listen to FDR, you will find great similarity in the language that both of these two men have used. Um, and it, je it was uh, very popular back then. It is very popular back na uh, today when we have lots of people struggling in the economy that we were just talking about in the prior segment. So he's appealing to young people who see an economy that seems to be rigged against them because uh, they get uh, less than minimum wage, uh, because they see that advancement may be complicated for them to, to get to where they want to be. So he appeals to that same constituency that in some ways was very similar to the FDR constituency back in the 30s. So that's what Hillary Clinton is facing, uh, an economy that doesn't produce for everyone. She is the establishment, and as the establishment, uh, she has to defend that establishment, and there are many flaws in that establishment. So she's struggling. Lewis, we have two candidates essentially offering the 2016 version of hope and change, and that is Donald Trump, who's got a lot of angry people behind him, and Bernie Sanders, as we've pointed out today, who has a lot of angry people behind him. As you mentioned before, as an advocate for minorities, that they are struggling in this economy, often dealing with raising families on minimum wage. Has Donald Trump alienated 
uh, the Latino vote, in your opinion, completely? And does Bernie Sanders mm. have any prospect of courting uh, Latino voters? Well, it's interesting because you have um, a phenomenon speaking about the Latino voter. Donald Trump appeals to Latinos who were born here, Hispanics who were born here, and their great greatest fear is that because there are so many people who are here uh, in violation of current immigration laws, that there's always a cloud of suspicion over the entire community. So there are people who are actually are US born Latinos who resent the fact that they may be asked to show ID or prove that they were born here, as opposed to the um, population that is here uh, unlawfully, and at the same time, they wouldn't be able to vote in the election anyway. So you have, but they do struggle because they're living here. So you have a, a two constituencies. Bernie Sanders appeals to illegal aliens because he wants to fix the immigration system and perhaps even make them legal. Donald Trump appeals to legal Hispanics because he speaks to their frustrations of being always under a cloud of suspicion because there's so many other illegal aliens. See, it's almost, it's almost. I, well. I think it's an interesting topic, and I'm going to bring it over to, to Dr. Bart. Lewis is talking about some of the American born Latinos in this country actually supporting Donald Trump. If you were to listen to MSNBC, you would think there's not a Latino on this earth that would support Donald Trump. I agree with Lewis that. Latinos are intelligent enough to filter out his words and realize when he's talking about rapists coming from Mexico, he's not talking about all Mexicans being rapists. But even if there's a few, it's a problem. Well, I, I think the Hispanic community uh, overwhelmingly is not going for Donald Trump. Uh, he, he has made arrogant and abrasive into an art form and he has directed it at, at minorities and Hispanics and immigrants. And I think that's most unfortunate. Even Reagan wanted a pathway to citizenship. And I think that even for those Hispanics who are here legally, they're sympathetic. And they know people who are here illegally, and there should be a process for them. So I think that overall, MSC, MSNBC is probably right in their numbers. The numbers will be very overwhelming against Trump in a general election. And, and I think Bernie Sanders has made himself into a legitimate candidate and uh, an authentic person, and he will appeal to the Hispanic uh, people. I don't think he's getting the nomination, but he's made a good pitch for it. Jackie, Dr. Barr doesn't think that Bernie is going to get the nomination, but he's certainly giving Hillary a run for her money, even in her own backyard. There are some polls that put him neck and neck with Hillary Clinton in New York State. Does this amaze you at all, picking up on what uh, Alan was saying? Well, sure. Picking up on what we were saying before is that Bernie is the one who speaks to their emotions, to their heart. Hillary is all policy. She's the one with all the experience. She's the one, frankly, with the leadership potential here to be president. But Bernie is talking to a part of us that needs to be heard. And it's not necessarily from the head. It's from in here. And that's why his numbers are so high. I'm going to vote for Hillary. But when I listen to Bernie, I constantly say to myself, right on, Bernie, that's exactly what needs to be said out here. That's how we're feeling. And Jackie makes a great point because you know that I'm conservative libertarian. And when I hear Bernie, I'm like, right on, you're absolutely right. He makes a lot of points, not only because he speaks from the heart, which he does, he's completely honest. I don't think he says anything that he doesn't fully believe in, and that's appealing. But uh, he's pointing out the elephants in the room that nobody dare does other than Donald Trump, perhaps. Right, and he's pointing them out politely and on a matter of policy, not through vulgarity, not through insults, not through discrimination. And that's why he appeals to a lot of people. I think for the Democrats who are now voting in the primaries and the caucuses, uh, picking up on what you said, there's really two questions. Um, looking at Bernie Sanders, people are saying, can we afford Bernie? And looking at Hillary, many people are asking, can we trust Hillary? And it's a question of which, uh, on which side of the fence you wind up being. Can we afford Bernie? Are his proposals realistic? Sure, he speaks from the heart, but are they realistic both in terms of money and are they realistic in terms of getting through Congress? For Hillary, the real question is, can we trust her? She says this today, but what will she say and what will she do once she gets into the White House? So that's why you see sort of a neck and neck race in some of the uh, various states, and that's why Bernie Sanders is doing well. It's 
also why Hillary is doing well, because of the experience. And many people are saying, yes, we can trust her overall. But other people are saying, no, we can't. Let's turn to Cuba. President Obama was down in Cuba uh, during a very controversial time, as it turned out, during the Brussels attack. But as far as opening up the pathway to Cuba, do you see this, you know, helping America, helping Cuba, helping the Cuban people? What's your thought? I think the one point that everybody misses is that barring a revolution in Cuba, if you're assuming that you have an evolution and the Communist Party still is in power, one of the things that the Castros have made very clear is that capitalism will not return to Cuba until Guantanamo returns to Cuba. So the whole point of discussion is, even in, when they had the joint press conference, the topic of Guantanamo came up. Cuba's position is, OK, Starbucks wants to come to Cuba, McDonald's wants to come to Cuba, Walmart wants to come to Cuba. Fine. We want Guantanamo first. So unless that's on the table and sovereignty is return of Guantanamo's return to Cuba the way Jimmy Carter gave the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians, nothing's going to move forward. Nothing is going to move forward. And I think that people in this country don't understand that. Policymakers don't understand how important Guantanamo is. So all these little plans, if you think about it, thousands of executives have gone down to Cuba since December 2014 when, when Barack Obama announced the new policy. How many deals have been made? Almost nothing. And the deals that have been made have been made as minority partners with the Cuban com uh, government, which is a partnership with the Cuban military to run hotels or have a restaurant or small, small token programs. But nothing substantial will come into Cuba until Guantanamo is handed over. All right, Lewis, Allen, Jackie, and Dr. Barr, thanks for your time and your thoughts. There's a whole lot more, a fresh outlook ahead. When we come back, it is time for the lightning round. More on that after this.